Hey everybody, welcome back to a new episode of One Mic, where I watch shit so you don't have to. And today I'm here to talk about Amazon Prime's original series, Them, Season 1, Episodes 3, 4, and 5, which I watched all of last night. So, if you're watching this video right now, you're probably here to get mainly get my thoughts on the uh, the scene, the one in Episode 5. Um, I'm going to uh, open talking about that. I didn't really know how I wanted to construct this episode, because there's kind of a lot of things I want to talk about, but I don't want this episode to to run you know half an hour long but I'm going to try to touch on a few topics but I am going to start with that scene because I've spent a lot of time kind of thinking about it uh I talked about it with my wife and I, I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around it because there's a lot of things with this show that I'm very conflicted on um where I, I kind of fall in this space where I don't know if if this has a purpose or not and I think that's probably why people have issues with this scene because you know, if you're like me and you've watched, uh, you watched my video on episodes one and two or <laughs> a lot of other videos on this channel, you've heard me talk about the idea of television shows insulting my intelligence, right? I don't like having a show play out something for me that I'm supposed to understand and interpret. And then they, in, then they, in addition to that, they go, they, you know, have a character explain it or they, they, in the case of them, they flash back to it again as a reminder, like, hey, in case you forgot about this, Here's what happened before. You know, I don't like that kind of stuff, right? And I think people, when it comes to that scene in, in particular, I think that people kind of fall in a, in a similar camp to the one that I do as it pertains to having your hand held for information. So what I mean by that is you can really only interpret that scene one of two ways. And the first way is is in, is in the vein of, of I didn't need that. So... Actually, it's not in the vein of I didn't need that. It is I didn't need that. That, that. that is why people have a problem with that scene. They feel like they don't need it. And we like if you if you are an astute viewer, you you didn't need that in the technical sense, right? Because the first the opening scene of the show, I th you know we are to infer from that and from the events that play out in the following episodes, we can infer from that that th that those people killed that that little boy. So. The people who are upset about this scene probably look at that like, I already knew they killed this little boy. I didn't need for them to come back, you know, in the fifth episode and show me in very explicit detail exactly how it was done. Like, what do I gain from this? And I understand that perspective because that's the perspective that, you know, I usually hold and the perspective that most people uh, would probably expect me to hold. And, and, and to a large degree, that's true. Uh, you know, I don't know if we needed that or not. Uh, but the second camp that you can fall into, which which I kind of actually, and I know you're going to be surprised by this, a lot of you, I kind of fall into the second camp, is that if we if we let the show just play out, right, and we don't see the details of what happened to the boy, yes, we can know that we can presume that those people killed that boy, and and that's not even much of a presumption. It's pretty obvious. The show basically tells you that, um, but. As the show has progressed, we've seen uh, each of these family members suffer some sort of consequences. And I don't know if this, and we don't know yet, I don't know yet, if this has anything to do with the murder of the, the, the boy. But um, we've seen uh, uh, Lucky has her, uh, her, her, her demon. I, I wrote in my notes, everyone has a demon. Lucky has the, the tall guy with the, with the hat. Uh, Henry has these uh, Sambo blackface characters that he sees in places for some reason, which is very strange to me because it's like I, I, I associate his issues with war PTSD and I don't know why he's seeing like blackface characters in places, but he has that that he deals with. The older daughter, Ruby, has the, the make-believe white girl at school who uh, who we just found out in, I believe it was episode five, that she wasn't even real. Uh, no, it was episode four. But that girl wasn't real or... I, I, I take this back. I'm not going to say that these demons aren't real. I'm just going to say that they're only visually perceived by the person that they haunt. So, like, the white girl that Ruby sees might be real, per se, but the janitor could not see her. Um, and then the, the younger girl, Gracie, has, has Miss Vera. And we would kind of be left to wonder just what it is that made... 
uh, that's made Lucky appear to be worse off than the rest of every, than the rest of the family. Lucky's the only one that is perceived as crazy by others, even though they all have issues. But Lucky's the one who, you know, people are just standing outside and they see Lucky chasing a little boy with a switch, or they see Lucky outside brandishing a gun, or Lucky goes to somebody's house and sees all kinds of craziness and then brings Henry over and he doesn't see it. So Lucky is clearly more impacted. That scene brings context to Lucky's behavior. If we didn't know the details of what happened to Lucky in that on that day, it wouldn't make as much sense uh, the way that she behaves right now. And I think I, I kind of fall somewhere in between on the sense of like, you could maybe relay a level of trauma that would justify Lucky's, not justify, I'm sorry, explain Lucky's behavior over the course of this, this, this show. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly what we saw, but I would make the case that simply, not assuming, because again, the show tells us this, but simply accepting that the boy was killed off camera by these people and that's what happened to him does not give the provided context to why Lucky is in the mental state that she's in. Like we see, like essentially, they don't give us a time frame, but this looks to be very quickly after this happened that they moved to Compton. So I don't know. It's it was a obviously it was an incredibly difficult scene to watch. Uh, I was very very nervous at the start of it. Um, I did have an idea that something was going to happen, and I did kind of presume that I was going to see what happened to the boy. Uh, so that added to my nervousness. But again, I didn't know what it was going to be. And I wasn't for sure going into the episode that that was what was what I was going to see. But that is what I assumed. And as the episode, episode played out, it, it did appear to be that's what it was. And I think it almost kind of made it worse that I knew I was going to see it, but I didn't know what it was. So um, it was very difficult to watch. But after the episode was over and I sat and thought about it, my immediate visceral reaction was, why did they, why did they feel like they had to show something that graphic? And there's a whole lot of instances throughout, instances throughout the course of the show so far where they have made a choice and I do not understand why they made that choice and the explanation has not been delivered yet. And I'll probably get into a couple of those things in a moment, but um, that was my immediate reaction was why did, why did I need to see that? Why did I need to see this in that level of detail? And as I thought about it, I, I, I came to that conclusion, you know, like if they, if they don't show that and we just walk away knowing that like we know Chester was killed by those folks in the beginning of that scene, all we all we take away from that is the knowledge of that of, is the knowledge that it happened. Um, and do we need the detail of that? Not necessarily. But when the actual the, the actual details of the event have such a strong impact on what we're seeing present day from one of the characters, there is some necessity there. Now, is it is it does it need to be that specifically? Does it need to be that gruesome? Not necessarily. But an argument can be made that the scene was necessary to provide context to Lucky to Lucky's mental state uh, at, in in Compton. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, you know, if you have different interpretations of the scene, or you guys want to talk about what you felt like the the director was going for there, or why that scene needed to be uh, uh, included in the show, by all means, let me know. But you know, you're watching this, you want to hear what I thought about it. There it is. Um, so I'm going to move on from that for the moment. And I want to talk about a couple of things that I did like. So uh, in the first two episodes, I talked about a lot of the actors having really big scenes where they can really showcase what they can do. And I liked a lot of the scenes that I've seen with Henry. I liked a lot of scenes I've seen with Lucky. And that continued in these next three episodes. I really liked the scene with um, Henry on the roof when the three uh, when the three guys come up and try to threaten him. And he says something to the effect of, they say, you need to come down here or we're going to come up there. And it was very, it was meant to be a threat. Like, you know, it's about to pop off. And and Henry essentially says, I need you to ask me to come down. So that way, when I give you what you're asking for, there's no misunderstanding. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's about to go down. Like, Let's go, Henry. So like, I, was, I was very happy to see that. He's looking like mad crazy in the eyes and they look shook. So I thought that was really cool. Um I really also really liked the scene with uh, Lucky and Betty where after, I think this was after they burned, uh, burned some uh, language that I'm not going to say on the, on this channel into her, uh, into her lawn. I think the next morning after 
Henry and the girls leave, Lucky goes across the street and confronts Betty. And they have a very, a very strong back and forth that I thought was very, very entertaining because I liked, I liked Lucky standing up to her like that. I, you know, given, given everything that's happening in this country over the course of the past couple of years and just the, 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 the state of affairs as it pertains to, to, to racial tension, I like seeing someone stand their ground in the face of, of racism and hatred and not even just stand their ground, but stand their ground threateningly. And she said, is this a threat? And, and I was waiting for, a I, I, you know what I'm waiting for in general is for someone to go, is that a threat? And for the person to go, yes. I don't know. <laughs> like, I feel like that's the hardest thing you could say in response to that question. And no one ever says that. They always like, they always try to like dance around like, no, it's not a threat. But if you do the, you know, like they'll, they'll, it, they'll say everything without saying yes. And I want, so I, I was really hoping that moment Lucky would look her dead in her eye with a straight hard face and go, yes, it's a threat. Like, you know, something like that. But I enjoyed that scene. But conversely, the next scene we see with Lucky, and it, it's two scenes later chronologically in the show, but it's the next scene for Lucky. We see Lucky trying to sell the house. And I'm like, you talked all that trash, like you were so hardcore right in her face. And then you immediately go run to the realtor and try to sell the house? Like what? Like to me, that undermined everything they had told me about Lucky up to that point. So like that scene really pissed me off because I'm like, I don't even know what to think about Lucky right now because I thought she was hardcore. And, now, and then, so this is all just an act. She's just going to act hardcore in her face and then turn around and run? Like you're going to run? Like the the whole the whole premise of the show is that y'all ain't gonna run anymore, and you, you're gonna tell me you're gonna run? Like this isn't making sense to me. And a large part of me still does not like that. But what I did, what happened later, is that we later see all we also later see Betty attempting to run. And not only does Betty attempt to run, she goes to ask her her father for a loan to help them move. Not only does she attempt to run, but my interpretation of that scene is that she was willing to allow herself to be molested by her father in order to do it. And she last minute changed her mind. And I thought it was an interesting dynamic between uh, Betty's family life with her parents and how they treat her versus how Betty is like the king of her neighborhood in Compton. Like she controls her husband. Well, she, she doesn't control her husband. She tries, but she, she, she's trying to become the, the, the person in charge in that household. And her husband, what's his name? Chase or something like that. He does. He seems very disinterested in threatening the Emerys, but um, she's attempting to kind of like bully him into it, and that kind of makes me want to segue into their their precious little uh, "Let's get these black people out" meeting. I, again, and I'm going to reiterate what I said in the first uh, in the video about the first two episodes. I feel like these white people in this in this community in Compton, they, these people are not threatening to me. Like these people are laughably coward cowardly. Like, I feel like these these people are just, I don't know, they feel like losers to me. Like, I, I'm sitting here watching, I'm like, y'all had a whole meeting just about this one black family. Like, a whole meeting. just about, It wasn't like, oh, we're having a town meeting and we're going to talk about this, 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 and this. And then somebody brings up the Emery's and we're like, hey, let's talk about the Emery's. No, they had a whole meeting about the Emery's. And then again, you got Betty constantly standing in her window doing absolutely nothing but attempting to emasculate all the men for not doing something that she's too cowardly to do herself. So like Betty is, is the show is almost, it seems like the show is trying to tell me that Betty is a threat, but all I see is a coward. Like all I see is someone who wants to, to bark orders from a safe place to the people who are putting themselves at risk. And I'm, I'm by no means am I trying to paint the men of Compton as, 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 as a sympath, as a sympathetic figure. But what I mean, all I'm trying to say is that, Betty's not about that action. Betty, Betty is only about the talk. And she wants someone else to do the action. And when someone else doesn't do the action, she has the she has the nerve to to chastise them. And I'm like, I, I'd be looking at it like, don't chastise me from your couch with your cigarette inside the house behind your fence. And you know, like she doesn't have a fence, but you know, <laughs> you know, don't chastise me from the safety of your home about what I'm not doing when you the one here all day. She was right here in your face five minutes ago. Like her husband obviously doesn't know that, but she was right here in your face five minutes ago. You could have been about that action right there. The whole block was standing out there. Y'all could have done, it was like eight of y'all and just one lucky. And y'all all stood by and did nothing. And then as soon as the men come home, you want to be like, oh, y'all got to get these black folks out of here. Like, okay, 
like so to me like the the, the racist people in this show in, in not in the show in Compton are just not intimidating to me at all like they're just to me they're just a whole bunch of cowards who who don't want black people in their neighborhood and they're gonna be mildly threatening the the the, the putting the fire on the lawn is beyond mildly threatening I, I obviously cop to that but um you know they're not doing anything at, at this point because I'm only halfway through the season. But at this point, they're not doing anything to make me feel like these people are an actual problem. All I do uh, every time I see them, all I think is losers, lames, and cowards. That's all I think every time I see them. They're losers. They're lame. They're and every time I see them, they further they further that thought in my mind. I have yet to see anything that that's going to deter me from that. So um, interesting stuff right there. Uh, I'm curious to think. If, I'm curious to know if any of you thought that. Uh, Bet the we're interpreting the Betty scene with her parents is essentially that her father used to molest her, and that he was like, "Now that you're back, let's start let's start it right back up again. Let's go let's go get that bath popping." <laughs> I I don't know how I found a way to to laugh at uh, molestation, but hey, here we are, right? Um, so uh, on a on the first video for episodes one and two, uh, cousin Cecil commented saying that he's really enjoyed the cinematography on the show and I have as well but I'm starting to wonder now and I'm applying this to not just the cinematography but the show as a whole I need to start getting some answers at this point I feel like they're doing a lot of things just to do them and again this is why people were so upset by the by the by the one scene because that scene if you don't look at it the way I did as in this is needed to provide context to Lucky's behavior if you don't look at it that way it's one of those things where it's another it's another example of doing something just to do it. And that's why I'm very conflicted about this show and that scene because, you know, I look at it as even though it does kind of feel excessive, I can say that I do feel like this is necessary to provide context to Lucky's behavior, but there's so much so many other things happening that feel like doing it just to do it that it's hard for me to make the argument that that scene was not also doing it just to do it, like doing some graphic stuff just to do it. So um, in episode, I think it was four, uh, it might have been three, whichever episode it was where Lucky goes to, I, I don't know if they said, but I'm assuming it was Watts. Uh, I think they say that her, her uh, uh, Henry's cousin lived in Watts. I can't remember, Hazel. But when she goes to visit Hazel, she takes the bus. She go, it's Basically, she goes to the hood. Number of black people there. Has a good old time. Everything's cool. She comes back, uh, and then the bus, the all kinds of weird stuff doesn't make sense happen. The the people disappear. The tall man shows up. She like she's dragged around, being thrown around. Uh, police come and say there was nobody here. And we see her. And there's a scene where she's like her head's leaning up against the bus window like this, and the reflection in the bus window is different than it should be because obviously it should be reflecting what she's doing she's just laying there just straight faced the reflection is laying this way and going <sighs> so it's like to me that and and throughout that episode they did a lot of interesting things with like windows mirrors reflections uh the conversation she had with the the cop that paints himself as being good but we find out i think in episode four that he's not no it's episode five at the beginning of episode five that he's not, uh, they do a weird thing where it's like they, they, they rotate the camera around the car, but the framing of their heads changes and you kind of can see like this. It's like, it seems like it almost like goes back and forth between being a reflection and not being a reflection. And for me, when you're playing around with like mirrors and windows and reflections, that kind of indicates a different world, right? So, uh, the heavy breathing from the reflection in the bus window would make sense, right? Because, uh, theoretically this all everything that we saw happen to lucky on that bus could have been just like a like an not an alternate reality but like a different world where in like in reality we see the, and there's a shot of this she's just riding on the floor of a bus and nothing's happening but in the in the other world she actually is being you know thrown around by these ghosts and whatnot so the heavy breathing of the reflection is like you're like, man, uh, you know, I was just in a, in a in a wild fight. So I came away from that. I was like, oh, this is really smart. Like, I kind of like what they're doing here. And then what did they do? They didn't revisit it at all. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I still don't know if that's, if that was the proper interpretation I was supposed to take from that scene. And I'm starting to wonder again, and this is why I say I need to start getting some answers. I'm starting to wonder now, are these, 
interesting camera shots. Like they'll have shots where the framing is like, I'm not going to do it because my, my, uh, uh, my camera here is kind of set to autofocus on my face and I don't want to get too close to my camera and mess that up. But the, sometimes the shot will be framed where a character's face is taking up like, you know, most of the screen and you might have a character like in the background on the foreground framed, like facing them. And they're like, they're doing interesting things with the camera. And uh, they did it a lot in a scene where Betty was talking to the milkman, which I can't remember his name from True Blood, but that's my man from True Blood. Uh, man, I remember his real, it's like Ryan Quanten or something like that. I remember his real name, but I can't remember his name on True Blood, but he was uh, Anna Paquist's brother. But um, yeah, uh, the the scene where, where B him and Betty were talking, they did a lot of that. Like they did like really tight framing on her face, which... <laughs> in addition to being the most reprehensible character on the show, personality-wise, Betty's rough on the eyes. They didn't have to put... They did not have to zoom in that close on her face. Uh, but uh, uh, that's neither here nor there. They they framed her very, very tightly. And then they 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 panned down. And again, and they stopped, I think, like about like right here. Like, they didn't they didn't go down too far. But I think we were meant to take away from that scene that, that uh, I think his name's George in the show that George is, is trying to get some. So, I mean, it, it, that's pretty obvious. But anyway, my point is that they've, they've done a lot of interesting work with the cameras. And that scene in particular, that stuck with me because I remember taking away from that scene that, okay, I meant to interpret that George wants to smash. And I'm and the, the bus scene, you know, I meant to interpret with all these reflections in these windows that um, there's kind of like two different worlds. But there's other camera work that's been done that I can't recall right now because I can't tie it to something that makes sense that kind of feels like doing it just to do it. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering if this is going to persist throughout the rest of the show, if we're going to get more uh, more fancy camera work that's going to play into the themes or tie into the themes or provide additional information, or if we're going to get more fancy camera work that's going to make me go, is this just fancy camera work just for the sake of fancy camera work? So uh, I don't really know. But uh, let's see, what else did I have to wanna, that I want to talk about? Uh, I talked about them all having their own demons. Yeah, that, that was important, the reflections. Um The last thing that I want to talk about is, and this is, again, why I feel like I need to get a lot more, uh, they need to start answering some questions in the second half of this season. Uh, there's a moment where Lucky goes to visit this other black family that lives a few blocks away from them. And she goes in there and she sees a number of a number of odd things, like the woman's writhing her hands to the point of them bleeding. Uh, there's uh, her husband had it, it has his legs cut off at the knee. Uh, looks like it might have been a war injury, but um, they did something very smart. They flashed back to when those people moved to town, and they showed them sitting at the desk of that real estate agent, and you can only see them from the waist up. So I don't know if that is an actual war injury, which is what it looks like, or if he had legs when he came to that town and he doesn't anymore. But the 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 legs are cut off at the knee and and they're wide open, wounded. Like you can see all the, you know, the, the insides of his knees and whatnot. The kitchen's like full of blood everywhere. The kids are missing, presumably killed, like all kinds of stuff, right? Lucky goes back. Oh, and also the, that woman mentions the, the man in the black hat, which is Lucky's personal demon. So why is this person, why, why would this woman be familiar with this person? But then when Lucky goes back with Henry, the guy is still there. He's he's still missing his legs at the knee, but it's it's uh like I think it's his like pants are over it or something. Like they they're not exposed. And then he's mute. He's not saying anything. The kitchen's perfectly clean. The everyone seems confused at Lucky's behavior. And again, this is now I'm wondering, okay, is how how would this woman know about Lucky's personal demon? Or again, did none of that actually happen? when Lucky was there the first time. And that's just maybe like otherworldly Lucky's experience, you know, seeing seeing the, the legs and seeing the kitchen full of blood and having her mention the man in the black hat. Is that just otherworldly Lucky's experience? Is this is is this like a like a split personality kind of situation for Lucky that is brought on by the trauma of what we saw at the end of episode five, which again, bringing everything back around, was meant to provide context. So I'm wondering if as the show progresses, we're going to come to find out more and more that 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 moment that right now we might feel like we didn't need it or or that it was excessive and that it was pointless or that, you know, 
they went too far, if that's going to end up helping Lucky's, well, uh, assuming she has like kind of like almost like two personalities, or there's two versions of Lucky, or or what, whatever mental trauma she might be experiencing, if if that was brought on by that moment. And again, you can make the argument that we didn't need to see see it in any kind of graphic detail. Uh, we could have seen it, but not just not within that detail. It could have been something entirely different that happened. But I I personally think that the writers were thinking like, we got to put something in here that's really hard to properly convey wh how Lucky was impacted and why she's behaving the way she's behaving as the show progresses. So um, right now, I, I am still going to continue the show. Uh, I, I am pretty conflicted on some things. There are some things that I really, really like, some things I really, really don't like. Uh, things that where I'm kind of just like, they need to bring this around. This needs to come to a conclusion. This needs to make sense later. So um, I'm going to see how it plays out. But right now, they're, st they're still doing a great job of, with tension. They're doing a great job with cin cinematography. They're doing a great job with um, even, even not I'm, I'm going to, I'm keeping these two things separate, but tension and fright, um, suspense, they're doing well. Tension, they're doing well. And then things that are actually literally kind of scary, they're doing that well too. The acting is off the charts. Like everyone, everyone is doing a phenomenal job on this show. Um, so a lot of great stuff happening. But at the end of the day, I'm going to I'm gonna bring this around to what I said at the start of the, the previous episode where I talked about one and two. Why are we making this? And I still don't know. I still don't know if this was needed. And it still kind of feels like black trauma porn. <laughs> so, um, I even though it is incredibly well made black trauma porn, it still feels like black trauma porn. And I don't really know when you get in a room with with other creatives and you go, "We want to make blank." I feel like you need to be saying, "We need to make something that our people need to see." You know, this is a story that that is not being told by traditional Hollywood. So let's make it ourselves. We're going to tell this story about black the black experience that has not been told before, and let's do it. None of that applies so far to this show. This show has not told me anything new. This show has not brought anything different to my attention. It has not even really portrayed anything in a different way because, like I said, Lovecraft Country did a good job. Lovecraft County, sorry. Country? County? I don't even remember anymore. Country. It's country. <laughs> Lovecraft Country uh, blended like the, fant the fantasy with the reality. And so, like, this has already been done by Lovecraft Country. Although, I will say, I like the fact that this show, when it comes to the, the fantasy elements, feels a little bit more grounded, a little bit more suspenseful, a little bit more realistic. Um, and I like that aspect more. So, I will say, in that regard, I like it better than Lovecraft Country, but it's not providing anything different so far. So, um, I'm going to stick with it. I'll probably watch another, you know, maybe another two two, maybe three episodes tonight. We'll see. No promises. But um, whenever I watch them, I'll come back with another video. And I'll see you guys then. Peace.